It's time to get started. So this is uh, Inside Active Job. This is the Beyond the Magic track. Uh, my name is Jerry D'Antonio. Um, and let's get started. So first, a tiny bit about me. Uh, I live and work in Akron, Ohio. If you're an NBA fan, you probably have heard of Akron. There's a, a local kid uh, who's a basketball player. He's done pretty well for himself in the NBA. I uh, went to school about uh, 10 minutes from where I live. Um, I work at Test Double. Um, you may have heard of Test Double. Uh, uh, Justin Searles, uh, one of our founders, uh, was on the program committee for Rails Coffee, he's, uh, um, and he's speaking tomorrow. Um, Test Double, our mission is to improve the way the world builds software. Uh, yeah. And I know that sounds very audacious, but we truly believe that every programmer has it in themselves to do that. And I believe every person here has it in themselves to do that, and that's why you're here. So um, uh, definitely it's been a great company to work for, and I'm very proud to represent Test Double here. Um, personally, uh, one thing I've done, my biggest claim to fame lately, is I created a Ruby gem called um, Concurrent Ruby. You may have heard of Concurrent Ruby because it's starting to be used in some uh, very well-known projects, like, for example, Rails. Uh, Concurrent Ruby is a dependency of Action Cable. In Rails 4 and Rails 5, it's part of, used by Sprockets. Also used by some gems like Sidekick, uh, Sucker Punch. It's used um, by Elastic Search, Elastic Search and the Logstash utilities. Um, and then the uh, Microsoft Azure Ruby tools. So. Uh, much of what I'm going to be talking about today draws on so my experience from that, um, but this is not going to be a sales pitch for that. This is going to be about active job and Rails itself. Um, so because this is a, the Beyond the Magic track, um, this is not going to be an introductory con um, topic. This is going to be... Um, this is going to be a deep dive into the internals of active job. So I've had to make a couple of assumptions in doing this. I'm basically assuming that if you're here, you've used active job, probably in production, you've used one of the, the supported job processors, you have some understanding of concurrency and parallelism. Um, if you need a, a better introduction to active job itself, I highly recommend the Rails guides. The Rails guides are very excellent at this and provide a lot of great information. Um, if you need an introduction into concurrency within Ruby itself, um, shameless plug, uh, I did give a presentation last fall at RubyConf called Everything You Know About the GIL is Wrong. Uh, that Check video is available on YouTube and, and that could be uh, an introduction into that. So with that, let's jump into what is active job. All right, so I need to briefly, in order to get into the internals of this, I need to briefly remind us of what it is and where it came from. So you know, active job, according to Rails guides, the definition is this. Active job is a framework for declaring jobs and making them run on a variety of queuing backends. Jobs can be everything from regularly scheduled cleanups to billing charges, mailings, anything that can be chopped up in small units of work and run in parallel. Okay, the couple key terms there. It's a framework, all right? We're gonna talk more about this, but Asynchronous job processing pre-existed active job. Okay, there were there were things like um, we're actually going to uh, uh, backburn backburner delay job, queue queue rescue sidekick sneaker sucker punch. Many of these things existed before active job was created, and active job came along as a way of unifying those. Right, um, active job helps us schedule has to be run later. That was mentioned briefly this morning in the keynote that when you don't want to block the currently running uh, web request and you want something to happen later, you use active job in order to make that happen. And that can happen through what we call ASAP processing, which is where get to this as soon as you can or by scheduling it at a later date and time, potentially. Okay. And this is also allows us to support full oh, parallelism. Uh, again, right. that's why Some of the job mean, processors right, are so multi-threaded. Yeah. Many of them, however, actually are forked. I'll talk about that uh, more. And can run and, multiple um, processes on so the machine and scale across the um, multiple processors and in some cases across multiple machines. Okay. And, and the so the, the, the impetus for active job is that background job processors exist to solve a problem. All right, we have these long-running tasks some, that we don't want to block the web request. So we want to be able to send a response back to our, uh, the, the user and get the page rendered for them. And some of these tasks then occur after that. So for example, if I'm sending an email, this email takes time. It's asynchronous to begin with. Why should I block the web request to make sure that, that email posts when I can send the response back and have that post shortly thereafter? Okay. okay. So, so active job supports that, and the processors behind that support that. All right. So, like I said, you know, active job. And this will be important when we get into the internals. Um, active job came later. 
there were all of these job processors. Each one was unique, and each one, they all did virtually the same thing. They had slightly different capabilities and went about it differently, but they all solved the same problem, right? So active job was created to provide a common abstraction layer over those processors that allowed the Rails developer to not worry about the specific implementation. Right? If this sounds familiar, this is not dissimilar to what active record does. Right, relational databases existed. Active Record created an abstraction layer over that that allowed uh, allows us to run you know, use different databases to, to fairly frequently switch between different databases if necessary. Most importantly, run different databases and test, prod, and dev. Right, Active Job does the same thing. It allows that abstraction layer that will allow us to choose different processors, change different processors as our needs occur, and run different processors in test, development, and production. Right. Um, and, and so Active Job had to do that while supporting the existing tools that people were already using. So according to the Rails guides, this picking your queuing backend becomes more of an operational concern. You as a developer don't care which backend you use is being used. You simply you know, write the jobs and let the, the um, and, and then use whichever backend in whatever environment makes the most sense. So, because we're looking at some code, I want to real briefly uh, remind us what the code looks like for Active Job before we jump into the internal. So, uh, this is a simple job class. This should look familiar to everybody. The important things are that this class extends Active Job Base and that it has a method called Perform. Right. Most of what Active Job does is encapsulated in the Active Job Base class which goes and will eventually, as we look through the details, call this perform method on your, uh, an object of this class when the job actually runs. And we'll look at those details, right? And as a reminder, the way we configure our backend is we use this job queue, like active job queue adapter configuration option within our application RB. Now, inside jobs, what I'm going to call the adapter we're going to build here, because we're actually going to build in um, here that's, a that's real that's adapter now. that is functional. That it, it right? is so the, the, all of the adapters that are supported by Rails have a, uh, um, a, a symbol that follows normal Rails inflections that maps the adapter name to yeah. we'll what you set the config server. value for. So if inside job existed as a supported adapter in Rails, this would be how you would, it would set that. All right? Then, so that's how you configure which backend you want to use. And then later when you want to use, actually do something later, you call the perform later method on your class, passing it one or more parameters. Okay? And that should look familiar to everybody. Um, and if you want to schedule the job for a certain time, then you can use the set function to specify when. And there's a number of different ways you can do that. So that's just a reminder of what we see on the front of Active Job. All of that should look familiar to everybody. What we're going to talk about is what goes on behind that when you make this perform later call. Okay. So like I said, we're going to build a <coughs> asynchronous backend here, right up here during this presentation, one that actually works and is functional and will meet a, it's minimal, but it will meet the requirements of, of active job and, and show us how this works. So a couple things just to give a sense of where we're coming from. Um, like I mentioned, there are multi-threaded adapters and there are forked adapters. Multi-threaded adapters run your job in the same process as the Rails app itself. Okay, there are a couple that do that. The advantage of that is those can be very fast, and you don't have to spawn separate processes and manage separate processes. All right. Um, you know, we, we all know that MRI Ruby does have some constraints with concern to con concurrency, but it's not as bad as most people think. That's what I talked about at RailsConf last fall. Um, and since most, MRI Ruby is very good at multi-threaded operations when you are doing blocking I.O. And most of the tasks we're going to make these background jobs for are doing blocking I.O. They're sending emails. They're, they're posting things to... Um, uh, uh, other APIs. And so since they tend to do blocking I.O., they tend to work very well with Ruby's concurrency model. So a, a threaded backend um, is simpler because we don't have to manage separate processes. Um, many of them, however, do use or uh, they, they do spawn um, fork separate processes where you have to run separate worker processes. Those give you full parallelism, but they require active management of those processes. So for what we're going to build here, we're just going to do a, a multi-threaded one because I can do that very easily and it will demonstrate all the things we're going to um, do. And we're going to use uh, thread pools for that. 
Um, most job processors will also persist the job data into some sort of data store. Um, Redis is very popular for this. The reason for doing that is that if your Rails process exits, either on purpose or by crashing, if you, all of your job data is in memory, you're going to lose it, and those jobs will never run. So generally speaking, for production, you want to have a job processor that does store the job data in some sort of external data store to allow it to persist beyond restarts. We're not going to do that here, mainly because in simplicity, I want to demonstrate what goes on in an active job. We don't have to go to that level of effort. So our job processor will not persist to a data store, so it makes it good for testing and development, right? but, but not necessarily we wouldn't, want to, we wouldn't use what I'm going to build here today for production. Okay. So in order to do this, we're going to need three pieces. All right, the first one is Active Job Core. This is provided by Active Job itself, and it is the job metadata. I'm going to talk about this more, but it is the thing that defines the job that you need to perform later on. It is probably the, I'd say, the most important piece of all of this because it's the glue that binds everything else together. The two pieces we're going to build today are the queue adapter and the job runner. Okay. Remember, active job came about after the job runners. So the job runner is independent, and it provides the asynchronous behavior. Right? The job runner actually exists as a separate thing. Sidekick is a separate thing. Sucker punch is a separate thing. You install those separately. The queue adapter has the, its only responsibility is to marshal the job data into the asynchronous job processor. So the job processor provides the asynchronous behavior, and the queue adapter marshals between your Rails app and that job processor. And those are the two pieces we're going to build here today, the queue adapter and the job runner. For all of the job runners supported by Rails, the queue adapter is actually in the Rails code base. Okay? If you go into uh, out to GitHub, go into the Rails code base, you look in active job, you'll yes. see that there is a, a folder of queue adapters, and there's one queue adapter in there for each of the, th the, the um, processors that, that Rails supports. There is also a set of unit tests as part of the Rails code base that are run against every one of these job processors on every commit, and they ensure that all of the supported job processors meet the minimum requirements of um, active job. The one we're going to build today actually will pass that test suite. And once right. it is uh, So strictly speaking, the Rails core team has responsibility sure. for the queue adapters and for the, that test suite. Um, but knowing from experience, the, the people who create the, the, yeah. the job runners themselves work very closely with Rails to make sure that um, those adapters are up to date and work yeah. well with the processors. So let's jump in and talk about the active job core right class. Like I said, this is the glue that ties it all together. It's not, right? it's not obvious. So um, is it, this is the job metadata. So it is an object that represents all of the information about the job you've posted. It, it, it carries with it the proc that needs to be run. So it carries with it things like the queue uh, and the priority, which we'll in a minute. And it carries with it all of that metadata. Okay? It provides two very important it's methods, which I'll talk more in a minute. Before. So. But they are the serialized and deserialized methods. Okay, these are very, very critical, um, but I'll talk about them in a minute. The job metadata itself, there are several attributes on this object which we will look at and use internally within active job. These are not things that you as the Rails developer have to know about, but these are things that in turn inside of active so job are very important. One of them is the queue name. Um, Most of us should be familiar with that. You can specify sure, when you create a, a post these jobs what queue it should run against. Um, Right? So and if you don't specify, it's the default request, queue. Uh, priority, some job processors support prioritization, where higher priority jobs uh, run first. Happens. We're not going to support prioritization yeah. in ours. That's optional. Um, but the priority would be attached to this as well. If you schedule a job to run at a specific time, you get an attribute called scheduled at, which tells you when. And we'll look at that because we are going to do scheduled jobs. Uh, the job ID is internal to Rails and is a unique ID within the Rails instance itself that identifies each job. Rails uses that within active job to track each one of these. All right. The provider job ID is, is one that you can provide within your job processor. So if we wanted to, within our job process, if we wanted to have our own kind of ID system that made sense for us and worked, we could then attach it to the job metadata under the provider job ID. Okay. So Rails does not create that. We would create that ourselves. We're not going to use the provider job ID today because it's, it's not essential, but it is available and it's something we would add. 
All right, so let's actually build a Q adapter. We're gonna go outside in, right? So like I said, the Q adapter is responsible for marshalling data into the job processor. The job processor is the more interesting piece, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, but we're gonna start with the Q adapter, and we're sort of gonna pseudo TDD this, right? Uh, the Q adapter, most of the Q adapters were written when Active Job was created because the job processors already existed, and they had to handle that marshalling. In our case, because we don't have a Q adapter, or excuse me, we don't have a processor yet, we can decide what the API is gonna look like. So within our Q adapter, we only need two methods. It's very simple. One is NQ, and the other is NQ at. The NQ method takes that job object we looked at a minute ago, and it marshals that into our processor. And the NQ at takes the job and a timestamp and marshals that into our job processor. So notice in this case, I've decided to make these API very simple. We're gonna create a thing called inside job. We're gonna have class methods NQ and NQ at. We're gonna call, we're gonna pass the serialized job. We're gonna pass the Q name. And in the case of the NQ at, we're gonna pass the timestamp. So a couple things to note. Um, one, this is not very OO. These are class level methods that we're calling on this class. And I did that because I want to emphasize the stateless nature of this. This is very critical to understand, okay? Active job is by its nature stateless. The state for your job is encapsulated in that job object. All, right? all of the metadata about the job, everything related to that job, all of your state is in that that we're passing through. The actual Q adapter itself is inherently stateless. We're, its job is just to, and you notice we even call a class level method when we post the job, because we're sending this thing to happen later on. It's a fire and forget. We're, we're not creating anything that's gonna be persisted, and in fact, any kind of stateful behavior in here would be potentially thread unsafe. So we're just gonna you call these class methods and throw um, this data at it, and then we'll build those class methods in a minute. And that's all it really takes to build a Q adapter, right? Now, one thing that's very important in here is the serialized method. And I have to go into this a little detail. <clears throat> the reason why we call the serialized method is twofold. First off, and, and less importantly, is thread safety. Remember, Ruby is a shared memory language that has object references. So if we have maintained a reference to anything that was passed into that, and we hold on to that reference, when this thing finally goes and gets processed later on, if it's processed in the same process on another thread, we run into potentially not thread safe behavior. Now, the normal usage pattern makes that not really a big deal, but if we serialize the job into a representation of that, we then let go of those references and make it thread safe. There's more important reason though, and the, the most important reason is for consistency. Remember, we want to be able to work with multiple job processors. In prod and dev and even uh, test, we want to be able to. So <clears throat> when those job processors are going to persist into a data store, such as Redis, they must serialize somehow. Now, we just can't take a Ruby object and throw it into Redis or throw it into a relational database, we have to serialize it somehow. Th that's sounding bad. So if every job processor created its own serialization method, we could potentially run into problems when we switch between these. We don't want to have hidden errors where we run this in tests and we run it in dev and all the serialization works and then we run it in production with a different processor and the serialization uh, fails or does something different. So active job provides one common serialization routine method and one deserialization method so all of the job processors can choose to serialize the same way. And in so doing, that will allow, make sure, it will, it will reduce one potential set of errors when we move between job processors. So we are going to serialize here, even though um, you know, this is the, the simplified version and we're not storing this uh, in a data store, we want to do that serialization to make sure we get that consistency across processors. So, all right, so <clears throat> internally, like we said, we need to do two things. We need to provide, inside the Q, uh, um, I'm sorry, I moved on to the job processor now. So we have the, the Q adapter, now we need the job processor. The job processor's responsibility is to provide the asynchronous behavior, and that asynchronous behavior is Q dependent. So we want to have multiple queues and have each queue process a different set of jobs. 
So for this, we're just going to use a, what we need is we need to be able to post jobs into different queues and have them behave asynchronously. We're going to use a simple thread pool for this, right? Because within the context of this simplified application, a thread pool works fine. A thread pool has its own queue, and therefore, by creating a separate thread pool for each queue, we do get a separate queue for these different jobs. We just have to map the thread pool to the queue name, which we'll see in a minute. And then, obviously, a thread pool has one or more threads and therefore provides asynchronous behavior, so we can very simply deal with these needs of the queuing and asynchronous behavior by just creating a thread pool, okay? So <clears throat> what we're gonna do here is we're gonna create the thread pool, but because this is all very um, multi-threaded and therefore needs to be thread safe, not only are we creating these threads within our, um, our job process itself, but because Rails can be run under multi-threaded web servers, we need to do, go through, jump through a couple hoops in order to get some, some thread safety here. So we're gonna use a concurrent map class. This is similar to a Ruby hash and supports similar APIs, but it has some additional behaviors. One, it's thread safe, but it also has some additional behaviors to make that work. Um, hopefully most of you know that with Ruby's hash, when you create a new hash, you can pass a block to the initializer, and that block will be called pass. if the key does not exist and that block will be used to initialize that key. So what we're gonna do is we are, whenever we try and retrieve a thread pool from our map Make of queues, um, if it doesn't exist, we're gonna create a new thread pool are, at that time. So we'll lazily create our thread to, pools um, as new queues are needed. Basically do, um, you know, as do this jobs together and just see kind of one way that you might So this uh, computer absent is, uh, is just um, a necessary right, thing in order to provide the, right. the uh, atomicity and synchronicity that we need to have in order to create this new thread right. pool in a thread safe manner. Um, so there's that there, some, some no, concurrency needs there, so but the end result is that's basically adding, like creating a, a hash and passing request. a block in um, to the constructor. And then we're gonna have a, a create thread pool class. In this case, we're just gonna and create a, a cache thread pool. Thread pool is a, a cache thread pool is the sure. simplest kind of thread pool we can create. Um, rather than getting into the details of all uh, the so different configuration we could do, oh, basically a cache thread pool has an unlimited queue size, it will grow, and add more threads as needed, and when threads become idle, it will shut them down and remove them, so you, you know, over time you'll get an optimal number of threads in that, um, which for our, our um, simplified processor is fine. Right, so now I mentioned that we need an enqueue method inside our job processor. It's gonna look like this. Basically, Action. when we enqueue this job, when the job is enqueued, we are going to um, simply well, post that, no, the job no to the thread pool, and when the thread pool That's pulls it off, we're going to call active job base execute. That's the important part right there, active job base execute. Um, the first line, the queue, like nice the post, that's just getting the, the, the thread pool, creating a new one if necessary, then posting that to be run by the thread pool whenever the thread pool has an available thread. Active job base execute is responsible for actually uh, interrogating the job, looking up our specific class to process that job, and then posting and calling the perform method on an instance of that and passing in the arguments, okay? So when you, in your class, early on we saw we create that perform method and it takes a set of arguments and it runs, active job base handles the interrogation of the job, creating an instance of that and calling that method. All we need to do is call the execute on that in our, when our thread pool takes us and runs it later on. And that's all it takes. Active job handles that, uh, like I said, the, the internals of that. And that right there is enough for us to actually post asynchronous jobs that are performed in an ASAP way in a real environment. Now for the NQ for later, it's a Assuming little more complicated right because now, we have to get into the time. Uh, you're gonna commit? So not fortunately, we do have at our oh, disposal a high level of abstraction that handles these kinds of scheduled tasks. Already. And coincidentally, it's called scheduled task, right? So the internals of scheduled task are sort of beyond the scope of this, but the idea is a scheduled task will take a number of seconds in the future that it, something is supposed to occur, and it will queue it up, and it will, at that roughly that Stuck. time, it will then pass it up into a thread pool to make it work. Check. Where we are so now. when we notice when we actually use our perform at and we use that set method, right? Check out. Rails provides a lot of convenience things for allowing us to okay. specify when the job happens in the future, right? Rails gives us all those great time helpers that we like, you know, one day from now and, you know, um, uh, one week from now and at certain times and so forth. Active job 
is responsible for taking all of those convenience things that we use as the Rails developers right. and converting them into a number of seconds in the future when this runs. Okay, so by the time we get this, we already have the number of seconds in the future. So in um, our so job we process, we don't have form. to worry about all of those, those wonderful date utilities that Rails has. Rails does that for us. So, right? so in this We're case, it's really convenient for us because scheduled task, not coincidentally, takes just a, list, a number of seconds Back. in the future when the thing should run. And in this case, uh, normally within concurrent Ruby, all of the high-level abstractions run on global thread pools, so you don't have to worry about managing your thread pools. In fact, most developers should never use a thread pool directly. Right? Most libraries that provide thread pools provide them internally and provide high-level abstractions that, allow, that use those thread pools. So under normal circumstances, a scheduled task or a future or a promise or any of these things would use the global thread pool. But in this case, we need a specific thread um, pool because that thread pool represents our queue. It's fine, I'm just so gonna... So all of the high-level abstractions in concurrent Ruby support ahead, dependency injection um, of just for, a thread you know, pool. Time so in this case, this executor option, which is very common, is a way of saying, when uh, you do run this device. thing, run it on this specific thread pool. So, so what we're doing here is saying, look, we know how many seconds in the future this thing needs to run. We, we know which thread pool we want it to run on. Just go and handle that. Schedule task handles sure, that, and secure. at the time the thing needs to run, it'll then grab that job, and it will run this block, and we're gonna do the same thing we did before, is just call active job base, uh, dot execute. That execute method Here's doesn't know anything like about once, the asynchronous behavior, generated. it just knows um, now is the time to execute that. So we're gonna have the our, same thing we saw uh, a minute ago. And, and just in case we somehow get a time gonna, value that's not in the future, we're oh. gonna just check that delay, and we're gonna you know, post it directly if, it's, if for some reason it's not in the future. And again, that's all it takes in order to like post to a task it. later on. Rails handles Rails. all the time-sensitive stuff. That's we true. just need to make sure yeah. that we can do it at that time in the future. All right? And believe it or not, that in its entirety is a like functional um, asynchronous job processor. Uh, so the, the next no, slide is going to have a right? bunch like more code no, on it that we normally should one, see. And, and I'm putting uh, it all in one slide because I want you to see just how simple this can actually be that, in fact, a so real functioning asynchronous job processor can, in fact, fit on one slide. And this is basically it. We have a class called Inside Job. We have our, our, our queues constant so where, we, where we have this thread safe map where we're going to keep track of all of our thread pools. We're going to have that create thread pool method, which will just return the pool we want. Then we have our NQ behavior, which just throws the job onto the thread pool. And then we have our NQ at, which actually looks at that delay and that timestamp and, and gives it to a scheduled task. And that right there is actually a fully functioning asynchronous job processor that plugs in, that can work with active job. And like I said, the other part was the, the, um, the Q adapter. And remember, the Q adapter just looks like this, right? It was simply when active job calls NQ or NQ at, simply post this thing off into my job processor. So that's it. So believe it or not, that is actually, I said, a, a fully functional asynchronous job processor that will work with active job and could be used in test or development in order to actually get asynchronous behavior without having to install registers under deep dependencies. <clears throat> so the next question you're probably going to ask is, all right, Jerry, are you going to put this code up online so we can look at it later? Right? And the answer is yes. If you want to see this code, well, you can find it in a very convenient place, and that's Rails. Okay? The genesis of this presentation was that last fall, I went to the Rails team and said, you know what would be really useful if we had a simple asynchronous job processor in Rails 5? Right, as you all know, we can, in our config, specify the inline adapter. The inline adapter will go and it will run the job synchronously so we don't have to deal with those underneath dependencies. But the problem with that is it's not real asynchronous behavior. And if we're using the inline adapter in test or development, we can sometimes mask problems by not having real asynchronous behavior. I said, why don't we just build a simple one, and it's, we'll call it async job. We'll make the, instead of, in, instead of inside job, it'll be async job. We'll make the, the symbol just async. And why don't we allow people in test and dev to run these jobs really asynchronously in order to potentially find um, bugs in them. And the Rails team said, that's a really good idea. And um, they worked with me, and we got this uh, merged into Rails 5 last fall. So if you use Rails 5, Rails 5 and you use the async processor, this is basically what you're going to have. This code was lifted almost line by line from the original implementation of that. 
Now, since then, the Rails team has done some refactoring on that. So if you go and look at the implementation now, it'll look a little bit differently. So just to give you some context of what you see different, um, they've decided to collapse things into one file. When I originally wrote this, I had two files, one for the, the queue adapter and one for the job processor, to sort of mirror that, that normal behavior you would have of the queue adapter and the processor being separate. They collapsed them into one file because they're very short and didn't need to be two. Uh, they renamed some stuff um, to go along with uh, uh, better Rails conventions. Um, they are assigning that provider job ID. Again, in this case, we're, we're not really needing it, but having that does, again, uh, provide for greater consistency with the, the um, production ones. Um, and they decided to throw one thread pool for everything and dispense with having multiple queues, right? Um, because again, in test, all we care that these things happen simul uh, asynchronously. We don't particularly care about configuring the queues for, for various different behaviors. So if you go look at it now, you'll still see async job, and it will do exactly what we showed before, and it's right now available in Rails 5. So if I've piqued your interest and you want to learn more about this, and see other things that you can do with this, uh, the two things I would suggest you look at more deeply are Sucker Punch and Sidekick. Uh, Sucker Punch is a threaded in-memory asynchronous job processor. Does a lot of what this does, but does it way better and more, and more fully. Um, the the um, creator of this tells me that the main use case is if you want to send emails from a, um, a, 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 a hosting provider, a, a one-click hosting provider like Heroku, you can fire off these emails because there's not a lot of a high cost of failure if that thing um, goes down. And so those jobs are just retained in memory and not persisted to a data store. But Sucker Punch does use thread pools just like this does. It does map those queue names to thread pools and provide some configuration of those. It also does some really cool things where it decorates every job with a job runner class that does certain cool things like track the number of successful jobs, track the number of failed jobs, handle errors, and do things in this nature. So it's a really good example of how you can decorate a job when you push it into a thread pool and do some really cool things. Like I said, for most of us, we shouldn't use thread pools directly. The high level abstractions in the concurrency libraries provide those capabilities. Um, but this is a really good example of how you can do that. Um, and also, Sucker Punch does some really cool shutdown behavior where if the Rails app is shut down for some reason, it will look at the number of the jobs that are still running and, and try and allow the jobs to, to um, ex uh, um, execute completely before shutting down and some other things. So there's some cool stuff in there. Um, and again, uh, Sucker Punch uses a lot of the tools that we saw in here. It uses uh, concurrent Ruby thread pools. It uses concurrent Ruby scheduled task. Um, another great one is, uh, of course, Sidekick. Sidekick is also an in-memory, uh, excuse me, it's also a multi-threaded job processor. It does not use, um, it does persist all your stuff to a data store, so that, that way your job data will persist beyond a restart of the application. It does not use thread pools, the way we saw here. Um, so Sidekick actually spawns its own threads and manages its own threads, but it still deals with all those same things with the internals of, of um, active job, and of course Sidekick has a whole bunch of um, additional features. Um, like I said, Sidekick doesn't use uh, Concurrent Ruby's thread pools, but it does do some use Concurrent Ruby for some of the low-level synchronization and, and um, atomicity stuff, thread safety stuff you saw here. So those are two great examples. If you want to look at this further, you can go look at those code bases and see beyond um, what we've done here. So with that, um, I just want to say again, I work for Test Double. Um, we are hiring. And we are also for hire. So if you, we, we love talking to people about software development and about software and about how we can all improve software. So if you'd love to chat with us, by all means, reach out to us. You can find us on email, social media. Um, myself and Justin will be here for the rest of the conference. In fact, Justin will be speaking on Thursday um, in the afternoon at 3.30 in, um, he's gonna be talking about our spec in Rails 5. Um, so I've got stickers up here. I've got stickers in my bag. Um, I hope to get a chance uh, to talk with you sometime before the conference is over. Is there and anyone with who that, again, my name is Jerry D'Antonio. Thank you for having me. So I do have five minutes if anybody has questions. I see everybody's getting to run out. That's cool. I'm hungry, too. <laughs> So, so the question was uh, resource contention um, within the job itself. If you have multiple threads running simultaneously and trying to do things, um, all of the asynchronous behavior is provided by the job processor itself. So all active job does is provide the compatibility layer. It's important that the job processors themselves 
handle all of the concurrency, any kind of locking or synchronization that is necessary. But generally speaking, if you follow the best practices, and a lot of that contention oh. goes away. So for example, you're not passing oh. an active record object, you're passing an ID, which you can then use to, to um, pull that up later on. We're no, serializing the jobs so that we're not uh, you know, kind of the, storing the references, sure. but, but ultimately it is up to the job processor itself to be and thread safe. Yes. So the uh, question was, would you be able to use multiple job processors simultaneously? And the answer is yes, but not through active job. Active job okay. only allows you to specify one handler. However, Again, all, as far as I know, all, you know, I'll say okay. most, but as far as I know, it's all of the, the job processors uh, your form. can be used outside the context of active job. Okay, so for example, you might specify, you know, Sidekick for being your main job processor, but say for certain things you want to use Sucker Punch, you would then just instant Sucker Punch directly, and so you can do it that way. Um, and I don't know, uh, I, I can't imagine why Rails would, would change that, but again, it's, it's very possible, yeah. Um, I, so the question was, could we subclass Active Job and have two different runners? Um, I, I, we've, I guess, again, it's Ruby, we could probably do anything we want, but you know, there's that so, one configuration uh, value of, within kind of um, the yeah. application config. I guess we could specify, you know, we, of course, we can create our own configuration kind of values. This, we could create uh, some new ones, grab those, and, you know, and do something of that nature. I'm, I'm sure it would be um, possible, but it's not something that would be directly or easily supported by Rails and Active Job itself. So multi-threading is just when you have multiple threads, right? A thread pool, so the question was difference between multi-threading in general and a thread pool. A thread pool is a managed Fine. thing where the queue and all of the threads are managed by the object itself. Yeah. So one of the things, like I said, the, so I could spawn my own threads just by calling thread.new, yeah. right? What happens if those crash? What happens if I want new threads? Yeah. What happens if I have idle threads? There's, you know, how do I enqueue go. those things there? There's a lot of plumbing involved in that, right? We can always right. spawn multiple threads, but in order to manage that, there's a lot of extra stuff. How do we handle exceptions, right? If you throw an exception on a thread, it will crash the thread. How do you handle that? So a thread pool takes all of that, puts it in one object with some very well-known, uh, very common cross-language yeah. algorithms, and manages those things. So you create a thread pool, you give it a, a set of configuration parameters, things like um, uh, how many threads to run at a minimum, how many at a maximum, how many things yeah, can you enqueue, good. if the queue gets full, what do you do, if, if you can't, exactly. if the uh, operating system won't give you more threads, what do you do, and, and it handles all of that for you. So that all you do is just create this one abstraction, the thread pool, and you throw stuff at it, and it manages all of that, that uh, in queuing and dequeuing, and, and if threads crash, it'll handle that and so forth. Deal with that? So, um, uh, you know, if, if them, kind of the, there, there the is some official. overhead in the thread pool itself uh, because of all of so that, but just like anything else, that overhead comes at the, the value of making you this not worry about task. those things, right? So generally uh, speaking, you start with the high level abstractions that use the thread pools, so you don't have to worry about that. Then maybe later on, you specify your own thread pools and, and inject them in so you get better control. And then, you know, uh, you maybe you if you're this guy over there, you just write your own threading yourself. <laughs> but uh, that's sort of the progression. And that and is a fantastic question. The question is, how does it handle exceptions? What we did here does not handle exceptions very well at all, right? The thread pool itself will protect itself from any kind of exception on the thread. All right, so thread pool will not allow its threads to die because of exceptions. Thread pool doesn't do much with them. All right. Again, this is one of the reasons to use that uh, to use a high-level abstraction because if you use like future or promise or act or agent, those things have consistent and idiomatic ways of handling things like return values and um, uh, errors and so forth. So. And if you look at and Sucker Punch, this one will do is the job decorator your... class in there actually handles the exceptions, it's like, a nice like little capturing bit of Rails exception magic. on yeah, the thread people, itself people before well. it bubbles up and then doing things with it. So again, the high level abstraction is what will provide things. you with better error handling and consistent and idiomatic and record of things are doing with return values and, and um, minimizing on the, the hand, weight sort of on things and so forth. And again, that's why you should always start with the high level abstractions and then only and inject uh, the thread pool. And the thread pool is meant to be the very lowest level in that and just provide sort of the engine. So, so like I said, the, the actual job processor itself one, will handle build. things like errors, right? So if you look, whatever you, which one of those supported job processors you use, they are all doing Any the error that? handling in this case. Because this is the bare bones minimum, I'm not handling errors at all, and, uh, right? Okay. They're just gonna, so, your job's just gonna uh, die, you'll not know about it. But again, this is meant to be minimal and trivial. There. But um, if you use any one of the uh, full blown uh, um, production ready job processors, and, they will handle the decoration of that job and they will handle the errors yeah. and they will have their own way of doing uh, that and you would follow the, the uh, they're that's one thing that active job does not include is uh, a consistent way of handling errors. So uh, of course you could always put your own error handling in your um, perform method and handle it there, 
but Active Job doesn't really do that for you. Oh, I, I wouldn't do one. <laughs> I mean, in terms of, of for production, I, you know, the ones that are out there are very fantastic. They're very mature. They've been used a lot. I wouldn't. The reason for this one was to put it in, in Rails itself so that for development and testing, you can run your tasks asynchronously and get a better understanding of how they're going to work in production. Um, one thing, I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, in and fact, one of the, here. if you go back and you look at that commit and you look at um, the, the actual discussion around that, that PR. It was actually uh, uh, DHH yeah. himself who He's said, like, hey, I really like this idea. I generally install Sucker Punch for dev and test. And it'd be nice if I could just do that within Rails and not have to have that extra dependency. Sucker Punch is great. I've worked with uh, um, you know, Brandon, the creator of Sucker Punch, and he's, he's fantastic. But you know, it's an extra dependency for just dev and test. Um, Rails had done a great job of writing the, the inline adapter for dev and test. So it makes sense for Rails to provide that simple async one. Um, and so we just you know, minimized what, what we actually need and put it in Rails itself. So now uh, for dev and test, you can do that um, and, and get a better sense of the real behavior in production, what it might be. I'm sorry? It's in Rails 5 now, yeah. So, like, so all you need to do is in Rails 5 is just say async um, in your config, and it's there. It'll be there. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you.